I think I'm recording. Yes. Okay. Like I said in the last group, um, I want this to be as interactive as it needs to. I know that many times during my class, people will not interrupt either because they are enjoying what I'm saying or because they don't have any questions. But uh, I really do want this to be as interactive as, as possible. So if while I'm talking about something, um, a question comes up, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask me a question. Um, let's make this as interactive as, as certainly as necessary, but also, you know, as possible. Welcome everybody to Spiritual Mentoring Group. Today is March 26th, 2017. We are two weeks, almost exactly two weeks before Passover. And so this week we're going to be talking about the Seder. And then next week, hopefully we'll be talking about some more spiritual insights, maybe talk about um, what chametz is, what it means to be leavened or puffed up, what that means, what that should look like. You know, like, what are we doing? Um, also, before we launch into the program, I just want to say a couple words about the Passover Haggadah. Now, there are a million gazillion Passover Haggadahs out there, um, many of them with different English translations, many of them with all sorts of commentary. This one is the Art Scroll, and it doesn't actually have a lot of commentary. It has translation, but it doesn't have a lot of commentary. It's mostly just the elements of the Seder. But there are so many Haggadahs out there because every scholar, every rabbi, every person, um, you know, has insights and things to share. And so they create these Haggadahs with their own commentary in them. And so if you have a rabbi or if you have an organization that you're very fond of, that you like to follow, like what they say, um, you know, it's a good idea to order a Haggadah from them. Um, even with the difference in translations and the different commentaries that exist in the Haggadahs, the Hebrew text is exactly the same in every single Haggadah. If we were doing the Seder only in Hebrew, which many people in Israel do, we don't, my family doesn't, because the rabbis have taught that the Seder is supposed to be done in the language that uh, everybody at the table will understand. So um, many members of my family believe that they really need to say it in Hebrew as well, so that we do it in English and in Hebrew. But um, the Hebrew text is a standard text uh, that was canonized many, 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 many years ago. And um, so you can always follow along. So my recommendation is if you have a favorite rabbi, whether it's Rabbi Nachman or, or you know, um, Rabbi um, Karlbach or whoever, um, you know, you get a Haggadah by whoever it is that you really, really love learning. Uh, I'm sure there's a Chabad Haggadah. And uh, go through the Haggadah before Passover. Now, if you're going to get one with a lot of commentary, it's going to take a little while to read through it. But go through and underline things that really are, that you find meaningful, that really stand out for you. If you do that, first of all, you go into the Seder really feeling very prepared. I was looking up something. I was writing, I'm writing a blog post about P Passover. And um, I had to, I thought that there was a phrase in the Haggadah that it turns out does not actually exist. And so in the process of trying to find it, I went through the Haggadah like two or three times. And what I realized was what an amazingly good preparation that was by going through the Haggadah two or three times this is the first year that I really, really feel, two weeks before Pesach, I really feel like I'm ready to launch into Pesach. And so um, I would recommend, if you can't uh, get a hold of a physical Haggadah, then do it online. But, um, you know, go through the Haggadah, read through it, read commentary, write down or, or highlight things that are meaningful to you. When you go to the Seder, take the Haggadah with you or take the notes with you, and uh, be prepared, because a lot of people will share it at the table. Now, as you'll notice, I'll mention a little bit later in the class, um, in homes where there are lots of little kids, sharing during the actual reading of the Haggadah is not so encouraged, because it makes the pre-dinner part of the Seder take so very long. And when you have a lot of little kids, 
you start to lose them. So a lot of families, what they do, and like what we did, was um, we limited the amount of commentary that went on during the actual reading of the Haggadah, but during dinner, we encouraged everybody to share insights that they had discovered um, things from their Haggadah, because we're all sitting around chatting anyway, might as well make it, you know, Torah, might as well make it relevant chatting. And so that's what we would do. We would um, do the chatting during dinner rather than in the middle. Now we do, my family, we have all kinds of crazy customs and we sing all kinds of weird songs like don't sit on the Afi Komen and um, everybody knows it's brisket and all these other silly songs. But um, other than the songs, we do try to keep the recitation of the Haggadah, especially since we're doing it in Hebrew and English, so it's going to take a little longer. Uh, we also have everybody at the table read, so that takes longer. Um, and so we try to keep the discussion. We won't shut somebody up, obviously, if they have something to share, we want to hear it. But uh, we don't encourage long discussions during that part of the Seder. Rather, during the dinner, um, people will share. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Actually, well, there's other to go with it before the question. Okay. I, when I was first in my synagogue, one of the older ladies who, one of our widow ladies, just a sweetheart, she's in her 90s, gave me at like 15, 20 Maxwell House Haggadahs. Oh, wow. So if anybody needs a Haggadah, I will be glad to mail them one. I'm actually <laughs> going to ask you a huge favor. Okay. Uh, by the way, thank you for that. Um, I will post it. Actually, if you can post it in the um, spiritual mentoring group, and then I'll copy and post it to the other group. Um, to Yeah, so that people can contact you directly. Um, but I need you to do me a favor. I need okay. you to open up one of the Haggadahs, and uh -huh. I need you to look and see if it has... Uh, the candle lighting bracha in it. I'll tell you why. Okay. When I first um, was, started my journey um, and I felt that God was telling me to light candles on Friday night, I had no clue where to begin. You know, I had no clue what the bracha was. Um, and when I pulled out my grandmother's candlesticks, in the drawer next to her candlesticks was a Maxwell House Passover Haggadah that she had given me. And inside the front cover of that particular one was the blessing for lighting candles. And so I used that Maxwell House Passover Haggadah to light candles because I didn't know where else to find the blessing. Back then, the internet didn't exist. So um, I have a Maxwell House Passover Haggadah but it's clearly not the original one because it doesn't have the blessing for lighting the candles. So I have been on the search for a Maxwell House Passover Haggadah that has the blessing for lighting candles inside the front cover. Or, you know, I mean, oh, that's very interesting because I have not actually used those since she gave them to me. Ha. Huh. So you'll so, have to open it and look. Uh, they're in my Passover stuff, my Pesach stuff in storage. So I'll have to get my box out. Okay. And I will do that probably, I might go do that as soon as we get finished, maybe tomorrow. No but rush. Quickly and find out about that. That's an interesting curiosity. Yeah. If um, I'm going to make a bet on it, I'm going to say it probably is there because she had these from when she was a young bride. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So I would bet that it's probably there, but I don't know that positively. I will check. Okay, that sounds really good. And like I said, there's no uh, urgent rush. I certainly don't need it for Passover, but um, I would like to have it to be able to show people when I tell my story. I think it would be fun to pull out a Maxwell House Passover Haggadah and say, here, see, this this was what I used. And, oh, that would be fun. Yeah, yeah, I think so. All right, so last week when we started to talk about Passover, I went through on this screen a uh, very rapid fire, kind of the history of the Jewish people from Abraham to the Exodus in like 
three minutes or something like that. I'm not going to do that today. Um, if you want to see it, you can look at the video from last week or, um, excuse me, or you can simply look it up yourself. Um, but I'm going to move forward. So it says in Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 23, that's where we read the commandment to observe the Passover. All right, we all know the story of uh, the Jews' redemption from slavery in Egypt and that God brought 10 plagues. And yeah, so that's one of the other things that I want to look at next week. This week I talk only about the elements. We're not going to go actually into details of the text. So if there's any part of the text of the Haggadah that, is, that grabs your curiosity that you'd like me to talk about, uh, whether it's the four sons or the, the, the four questions or uh, any other part of it or the plagues, uh, I'd be happy to concentrate on that. So just let me know what grabs your curiosity. Um, but anyway, so most people are familiar with the story and, um, and know that we're commanded to observe the Passover throughout history, right? For, forever. It's a commandment from God. You know, we're commanded in several places. Here's one example in Baikra chapter 23. All right. But the thing is, the Passover Seder is, you know, the, the whole event, the whole thing of the exodus from Egypt is, is not just that we're supposed to remember what God did for us. <clears throat> Although that's very, very important because it's part of our national identity. It's part of how we can have faith in God because faith in Judaism is not blind faith. It's, it's trust based on a history. We have a history with God. But more than us remembering it is that we are supposed to literally be passing it on to the next generation. So, for example, it says here in Shemot chapter 12, verses 26 and 27, and when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? You shall say it is a Passover sacrifice to Hashem who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshiped. And everything, every element that was put into the Passover Seder is designed to engage the next generation, the children. And I said this in my other class, and I said it last week, I'm going to say it again. If there is any way that you can make sure that you get to a Seder where there are children, it's really important. Because while we have a commandment to keep the Passover, regardless of whether we have children or have children anymore or whatever, uh, the truth is, is that part of the mitzvah is the telling of it to children. And uh, like I said, so every element, everything on the table, on the plate, everything we say is designed to arouse the children's curiosity, to engage them, to get them to ask good questions, and, you know, to keep them interested in hearing the story. Let's get down to it, all right? To commemorate this event and to fulfill the commandments, our sages created the Passover Seder. The word Seder means order. And there's a basic text around which all Passover Seders are organized, of course. And I said this at the very beginning. They all use the same exact Hebrew text. It's just that the commentary and the translation may be different, okay? But we're all, every Jew on the night of the 14th of Nisan into the 15th of Nisan, every single Jew is reading from the same text. It's, that's a, an incredible thought that like, I don't know if there's any other moment throughout the year when in many ways we are as unified. I suppose you could say the fact that we all fast on Yom Kippur, but those are just moments. We have 365 days, and there are only a couple of days a year when the majority of the Jewish people are doing the same thing at the same time, engaged in the same activity with the same 
headspace, mindset, focus. It's an incredible, incredible idea. I mean, incredible concept. So as we said, the book is called a Haggadah. And the word Haggadah actually means the telling or the story. And by following it, we work our way through the story of the Exodus from Egypt. There are 15 basic components to the Passover Seder, which we're going to go through in just a couple of minutes. During the course of the evening, we drink four cups of wine, although I will explain later, some people actually drink five cups of wine, even though that's a less common custom. We eat vegetables dipped in salt water. We, of course, eat matzah, which is, you know, basically a cracker-like bread. We eat bitter herbs, often horseradish without additives and romaine lettuce, uh, dipped into something called charoset, which is a paste of nuts, apples, pears, wine, cinnamon. It varies, which I'll get into in a little bit. And, of course, we have the festive meal, which has all sorts of um, usually very traditional foods are served at those meals. Okay, so that is the Seder. And like I said last week, there are 15 components and I read them to you. And I'm not going to read them to you again now because we're going to actually go through them. Okay, but before we do, one of the things that I want to look at is the Seder plate. Okay, because the central feature of the Passover Seder is the Seder plate. Now, although it's usually a fancy, very special serving platter that's designed exclusively for this purpose, it doesn't have to be. Any large plate arranged with small bowls or cups or, or anything, you could even take plastic cups and cut them so that they're short. Um, anything like that will work. And there's no law that it has to be a specially set aside plate. Uh, I mean, you see in the picture there, there's a very fancy plate with very fancy bowls, but you could see that you could makeshift something very similar, right? So um, it's funny because it's our custom that every married man at the table, at the Seder, has his own Seder plate. So as you can imagine, if we had a lot of people, that would be a lot of Seder plates, and it takes up a lot of room. Back when we first started observing we didn't know, um, and we had every man at the table who was over bar mitzvah age, so that included our three sons and any of their friends that were with us, every male had their own Seder plate. As you can imagine, that took up a lot of room on the table, and we actually ran out of plates because not everybody brought one, so we had to do makeshift plates. We took a big glass platter, and we put little bowls on it, and we put the the elements on the platter uh, in the bowls and and so that we did it so um if you don't have a seder plate that's fine don't worry about it um just do whatever you need to do in order to uh, have all of the elements on the table okay um by the way we later learned that um it's usually the custom that only the married men have seder plates which was a huge relief for me because not only did it free up space on the table but that was a lot of dishes to wash. <laughs> a lot of dishes to wash. Okay, on the Seder plate, there are six small bowls. And the six elements on the plate are maror, chazeret, charoset, karpas, zeroa, and beitza. Now, the first two I mentioned, maror and chazeret, are both called bitter herbs. They're two different kinds of bitter herbs. One is bitter. That's the romaine lettuce. And the other one is more harsh or stinging. That's the horseradish, right? So these two different bitter herbs actually represent two different kinds of bitterness that one endures in slavery. The chazeret, which is usually romaine lettuce, it's not pleasant, but it's not inedible. It's not something that you can't manage, right? It's something that you can become conditioned to. And, you know, if you eat enough of it, it, it can make you stronger, it can nourish your body, okay? The other maro, which is usually horseradish, doesn't seem so bad at first, but then it shocks your system. And when you're done eating it, though, and it's so funny because my guys always try to use this as an opportunity to show how macho they are. 
and they'll take the horseradish and you'll know, start chewing it and they're like, well, it's not, it's not very strong this year, you know? And then all of a sudden everybody's face turns bright red and they start coughing. And it was funny because when my father was alive, my father was bald and his entire forehead would just become bright red from the horseradish, like raising his core temperature. I don't know what, but the interesting thing about the raw horseradish is that after you've chewed it up, after it's gone, it's gone. Like there's just no trace of it anymore. And so the first one, the, the uh, lettuce, is representative really of physical slavery. It's hard, it hurts, it's unpleasant, but it can be endured most of the time. I mean, obviously there are levels of slavery that are not endurable, but, or, but it can be and you can become conditioned to it. The second one is representative more, I think, of like a spiritual slavery. It's the giving into a mindset that leads one to forget the sting of what they experienced and even be able to rewrite history. If you think about it, when we read the story of the Jewish people leaving Egypt, right? They, you know, they had just leave, left Egypt. They saw all the plagues that God had um, done to the Egyptians. And now they're here on the edge of the river and they're scared. And what do they start doing? They start talking about how amazing it was back in Egypt. Well, no, it wasn't amazing back in Egypt. They were crying out for God to save them, right? But in that moment, the fear of where they're at made them kind of forget how actually awful it was in Egypt. Better the slavery they knew and were familiar with than the freedom they didn't know and had an unknown element to it. So it was scary. The third item on the plate is charoset. Now charoset is a thick pasty mixture that is said to represent the mortar which was used to build with, okay? Uh, some say the mortar, some say the actual clay that the bricks were made from. While every family and tradition has their own style of charoset, the one thing that they have in common is that they're all sweet. Charoset is sweet. Now, typical Ashkenazi charoset is made with apples, crushed nuts, wine, and cinnamon. Some people use pears instead of apples. Um, the typical Sephardi charoset has a date base rather than an apple base, which makes it much stickier, in some ways also sweeter, um, but much pastier, more like the clay that you would use to make bricks, okay? On a more practical level, the charoset adds a pleasant relief to all of the bland, bitter, and even hot, you know, sharp food that we eat during the course of the Seder. When I make charoset before Pesach, I make a big batch and it is completely consumed before the end of Pesach. All of the members of my family really, really love my charoset. They'll eat it as a side dish. They'll eat it as dessert. They eat it throughout the week. And so I make lots and lots of charoset before, right before Passover. All right, next up on the plate is karpas. This is a vegetable, usually parsley, but it can also be celery, potato, onion, right, celery, potato, or onion. <laughs> and um, depending on the person's tradition, I'll discuss later why we dip the karpas in salt water, but as with all Jewish traditions, there are of course several explanations for its presence. Now, traditionally, like I said, parsley is used it said that as a green vegetable, it represents like the flowering of the Jewish nation before they went down to Egypt. And then we dip it in the salt water, which kind of represents the Jewish people's tears as they were shed, as they became enslaved. So in this case, almost to, um, really almost any vegetable would suffice, right? Um, so in my family, we put both parsley and boiled potato on the table because the potato is a little bit better at 
um, keeping you from getting super hungry. Now there are limits to the amount of a veg of the carpas you're supposed to eat. You're not supposed to be eating enough that assuages your hunger because you're supposed to get to the point of eating the matzah that you're actually really hungry. But I find that if I don't eat something at that point, because we're you know probably been sitting at the table for I don't know 15, 20 minutes anyway, maybe a half an hour. I'm usually starting to get quite hungry and I won't make it all the way to the meal if I don't eat something. So uh, we use potato and we use parsley and allow people to choose which they want to actually dip in the salt water. Um, but yeah, you're not supposed to eat enough of the carpas to even begin to feel satisfied, okay? So another explanation for why we use parsley is that visibly the parsley looks a lot like or representatively looks like the hyssop that was used to apply the Passover lamb's blood to the doorposts of the houses on the night of the exodus from Egypt. And in that case, the parsley or the celery would of course be preferable. The next item on the Seder plate is called zaroa, and that is the roasted lamb or goat bone. Nowadays, people will also use chicken bones. Any bone is really considered acceptable today because it's meant to represent the Passover sacrifice, the Korban Pesach. The lamb was offered in the temple and then it was eaten on Seder night. It was eaten at the Seder. So it may sound at first like a great idea to have roasted lamb as the main dish for Seder night. Kenazi custom is to refrain from lamb and actually any roasted meat on Seder night because the Torah tells us explicitly that we're only to sacrifice animals on the altar in the temple, right? And since we don't have a temple, we can't sacrifice, we, we can't have any sacrifices. So we don't eat lamb or roasted animal on the Seder, at the Seder, because we don't want someone to mistakenly think that we made a sacrifice somewhere else, which of course would be forbidden. So it reminds us though, that even though we're free in many ways, we're still really in exile and awaiting the final redemption when the Messiah is going to come and make everything the way it's supposed to be. The last item on the Seder plate is the Beitzah, or the roasted egg. And this serves as a symbol of the Korban Chagiga, which is the festival sacrifice, which was in addition to the Passover sacrifice. It was uh, the reason that I thought of Rivka as I started to talk about this is because she had asked about putting the egg on the plate and whether that is still done. So the egg is on the plate as a symbol of this Korban Chagiga, which was in addition to the Korban Pesach. Korban Pesach. So we had we had a sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice specifically, and we have a lamb or chicken bone on the, the plate to represent that. And back in the time when the temple existed, we also made a holiday offering, which was separate from the Passover offering. And so in remembrance of that, we have this egg. Now, uh, I did not research why specifically the egg would be representative of the sacrifice specifically, but it, uh, it is. And um, unlike the roasted lamb, which is avoided during the Seder meal to avoid what we call ma'arit ayin, which is, or some people will pronounce it maris ayin, uh, basically the idea that someone might mistakenly think we've done something forbidden, even though we haven't because it looks like it. And so it's customary not to do those things that might lead someone to think that we have done something you're not allowed to do. For example, um, you know we're not allowed to do laundry on Shabbat, right? And so if you do laundry on Friday and you go to hang it out, you're supposed to take it in before Shabbat comes. You're not supposed to leave the laundry hanging out on Shabbat. Why? Because someone might think that you left the laundry, that you hung the laundry on Shabbat. And it's one of those things where you don't want your actions to mistakenly 
lead somebody else astray. Like if somebody sees my laundry hanging on the line on Shabbat and they think, wow, I mean, Panina is a very knowledgeable person. And if she's hanging laundry on Shabbat, then it must be okay to hang laundry on Shabbat. I'm going to go hang laundry on Shabbat because then what I've done, which was totally permissible, washing my laundry on Friday and leaving it overnight on the lawn, on the, the line, um, I have now sinned because I've caused somebody else to actually do something you're not supposed to do on Shabbat because I left my laundry on the line. So, um, so in order to avoid this type of a, a situation, we don't eat the roasted animals at the Passover Seder. However, the egg, which also represents a, a sacrifice though, uh, it's, it doesn't look anything like a sacrifice. You never sacrificed eggs. So it's okay for us to eat egg. And in fact, many families serve a hard boiled egg as the appetizer that begins the actual meal. In our family, we serve something called Sephardi long cooked eggs, which are really cool. You take eggs and you put a bunch of onion skins and you put them in a deep pan and you fill it with water and then you put a layer of oil on top and then you cook it for like 24 hours at a low temperature. Maybe it's not 24, maybe it's 15 hours, but a very long time for cooking eggs, right? And what happens is the eggs absorb the color and the flavor from the onion skins and the the eggs become like this reddish brown almost like the color of this um the hagada here the the eggs become this reddish brown color and when you eat them they have this really smooth nutty flavor and it's just amazing if you ever have an opportunity to eat safari long cooked eggs especially if they're done correctly do it. It is really yummy. We have it every year at our Seder. It's the first thing we eat. And it's okay because nobody would think, oh, they sacrificed what? An egg? You know. All right. Now that we've looked at the Seder plate, now we're going to take a look at the components of the Seder itself. And the first one is Kadesh. What does that word sound like? It sounds like Kiddush, right? The Seder service begins with the recitation of Kiddush, which is what we say at the beginning of every Shabbat and every holiday. It's how we sanctify or proclaim the holiness of the holiday. And this is said while holding a cup of wine. This is the first of the four cups that we will drink while reclining throughout the Seder. Why four cups of wine? So, like I said, as in everything, there are several explanations for the custom, but the most common explanation that is given is that the Torah uses four expressions of freedom or deliverance in connection with our liberation from Egypt. It says in Shemot chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am Hashem, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Hashem your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, if you notice, I underlined and bolded four different statements that are in that passage, right? I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And I will take you for my people and I will be your God. Those are four different statements of redemption. And the four different cups of wine are said to each represent, each one represents one of those statements of uh, redemption. All right. There are also some link the four cups to the four great merits that the children of Israel supposedly kept in, had in exile. You know, they didn't change their names. They, they continued to speak Hebrew. They uh, continued to dress like Jews because the Egyptians, of course, dressed very modestly. Uh, and they remained uh, loyal to one another. All right, so like I said, there's always more than one explanation of why we do things. And the truth is, is that we don't know exactly how they came to be, but those are the two different uh, theories as to what the four cups represent 
the first one is really the generally accepted uh, explanation for why we have four cups. Um, when drinking the four cups and eating the matzah, we lean on our left side, kind of in a reclining position. And we do so to accentuate the fact that we are now free people. In ancient times, only free people had the luxury of reclining while eating. And of course, as you may remember, the original Pesach, uh, we are told that we are to eat it in haste, right? With your, it says, with your loins girded and your staff in your hand and you eat it in haste. They were, uh, they were slaves who were about to be free. And so they didn't have the luxury of reclining like we do now. But well, we're not, in theory, slaves, and we are free people, and so we recline when we eat to represent that idea. Now, it's interesting to note that there is an additional phrase that comes right after this, because that was chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. But verse 8 is directly connected to the statement, and it says, I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Avraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am Hashem. So you can read it kind of like, you know, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and I will bring you to the land which I swore to your forefathers to give it to you as a possession. So. Because of this, there are some people who actually have a custom of drinking five cups of wine and not four at the Seder. My son-in-law and his family have that custom. There are people, it's not very common, but there is a whole group of people who actually have five cups of wine instead of four. Next is number two, we call urchatz. Urchatz means washing. Now, at this point in the Seder, we've really only just begun the Seder, we wash our hands in the usual ritually prescribed manner, okay? If it's your custom to do two and two, that's what you do. My custom is three and three. Uh, but you wash it just like as if you were going to wash for bread, but you don't say the blessing. The reason that we wash at this point is the next step in the Seder which is called karpas, which requires us taking the vegetable and dipping it in the salt water. So Jewish law specifies that certain West wet foods must be eaten with a utensil. And if you're not going to eat it with a utensil, you have to first purify your hands before you eat it. But because we're not washing for bread, we don't make the blessing. We just do the washing, and then we sit down and we continue with the Seder. All right, and the next step is karpas, which is actually the Greek word for a fresh vegetable. Go figure. The karpas, like I said, is a small piece of vegetable, usually parsley or celery, but in some cases it's also onion and potato, and we dip it in salt water, right? After dipping it in the salt water and making the blessing, we eat it. All right, now many people are careful to dip first and then make the blessing so that it's not mistaken that we're making the blessing on the dipping, okay? Um, but we make the blessing for the vegetable. And when you make the blessing for the vegetable, keep in mind that that's also going to cover the lettuce, the bitter herbs that you're going to be eating in a few minutes, all right? So we make the one blessing over the fruit of the earth and that is for the parsley and it's also for the maror, the bitter herbs, okay? The salt water that we're dipping into is supposed to, as I said earlier, represent the tears that were shed by the Jews as slaves in Egypt. Now, I said that karpas was a Greek word, and you will find that many of the words in the Passover Seder are actually Greek and not Hebrew. And this is because much of what has become the Seder that we now know and love was instituted during a time when Greek and Aramaic were the main languages spoken in the home and on the street. I mean, Jews always, you know, Hebrew has always been Lashon HaKodesh, the, the holy language, 
right? It was used for prayer and study, and it never stopped being that. So when people say that Hebrew was a dead language, it's not really true. It's just that it wasn't a, a conversational language, um, but it's always been used for prayer. But really, because of that, knowledge of Hebrew was primarily limited to those who were well-educated. The women, the children, common masses, they might have been able to read Hebrew, but they certainly did not speak it. And so much of the, what came about to be, excuse me, part of the Seder, there's a lot of Greek words in the Seder, basically, okay? All right, the next element, which we're up to number four, the fourth element is yachatz, not to be confused with urchatz, which is washing. Yachatz is breaking. So now the person who's leading the Seder takes the middle of the three matzahs on the Seder plate and breaks it into two pieces. Unlike the picture that you have on the screen, it's not supposed to be broken down the middle. It's supposed to be a smaller piece and a larger piece. All right. The smaller part of the middle matzah is returned to the Seder plate. This broken middle matzah is referred to as the bread of poverty, and it remains visible as we tell the story of the Exodus, which is going to be the next step. And it will be eaten shortly thereafter. The larger piece is put aside for later use as the afikomen. Afikomen is also a Greek word which actually means dessert. I mean, if you break it down, it means that which comes after, but um, dessert. Uh, and, and so we, after we've eaten the whole meal, we will partake of the afikomen so that the last food taste in our mouth is the matzah, part of, because that was, you know, that's the mitzvah for the night is eating the matzah. All right, so this unusual action of breaking the matzah not only attracts the child's attention, once again, but also recalls God's splitting of the sea of reeds to allow the children of Israel to cross on dry land. It also is an important symbol because it is, the matzah is considered the poor bread, right? And when somebody is poor, they frequently don't have a whole fresh loaf, you know? They have to, you know, eat the bits and parts and whatever that they have, broken loaves and crumbs. And, and so, um, so we do this to remind us of the pain and poverty of our symbols under the Egyptian oppression. They ate crumbs and they had to ration their food. Our forefathers were so poor that they had to divide and break up their meals eat a little bit now, save the rest for later. By the way, this is part of the reason that the unleavened bread is called the, the poor man's bread uh, It's and the bread of affliction. It's not just that we didn't have time for the bread to rise when we were leaving Egypt. I mean, the truth is, is that we knew we were leaving a lot, much in advance of when it was going to happen. But when you're a slave, you know, and you're working, and then at the end of the day, you get your small ration of food, let's say a, a cup of flour or whatever it is that you're given. You go home, and you're starving. You're really hungry. You don't have time to wait for that dough to rise, right? I mean, like, think about it. Um, back then, they didn't have instant yeast. It had to be cultured, and it took a long time to actually raise the bread. So if you're poor and you're a slave, you're going to take that flour, you're going to mix it with water, you might add some salt if you have some, although back then salt was very expensive, and you're going to pop it in the oven and you're going to eat it as soon as it's edible. You're not going to wait for it to rise several hours. You don't have that luxury when you're a slave. And so the flat, unleavened, unpuffed, unrisen bread becomes the symbol of slavery okay but the question might be asked why three matzahs i'm sure everyone here is waiting for some like really super spiritual answer to this question well i'm sorry to disappoint you like many things in judaism there is no one real answer to this question of course 
But for absolutely sure, 100% sure, the three matzahs do not represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I promise you. Okay? Now, what they may represent is the three castes of Jews, right? The Kohen, the Levi, and the Israel. They are also said to represent Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in whose merit we were redeemed and brought to inherit the land of Israel. There's another idea that they represent the three handfuls of flour that Abraham told Sarah to take and bake into matzot for the three angels who were visiting them. For sure, we know that the number three has significance in Judaism. But the real reason? Really? The real reason? We're supposed to have two whole loaves of bread for making Kiddush and Hamosi, right? You do it every Shabbos. Um, we also do it at every holiday meal. Two whole loaves. Even if, if, you're, if you're just, if there's only two of you and, you know, you can't make big loaves, make little rolls or whatever, but they have to be whole loaves unless it's just impossible, okay? So here's the thing. If we break one of the matzahs, for the previous stage, right? Where we're going to take half of it and make it into the afikomen. If we break it, how much matzah do we have left on the table? If we started with two, we now only have one and a half. We don't have two full loaves, right? So you can't make hamotzi on two full loaves. So you add an extra one, and now you have two full loaves plus the half one that was broken. Right? And that way you have those two full loaves and you can make hamotzi on it. That's it. That's the reason we have three matzahs on the seder, on the table. So that when we break the one matzah, we still have two whole ones left for making the blessing. That's it. Nothing super spiritual but definitely something that makes us ask a good question, right? Okay, before I move on to Magid, does anybody have any questions or statements or anything they want to say? All right, Magid is from the same root word as Haggadah. Haggadah is to tell a story. This is the main part of the Seder. This is where we get to the heart of the Seder. This is where we tell the story. This is also the longest part of the Seder and can easily take an hour to get through. It is traditional to have candy or fruit or nuts at the table to hand out to children who ask good questions during this section of the Seder. I mean, at this point, we've already been sitting at the table for at least a half an hour, right? And younger children can get quite bored and be ready to run off and play. So we do, and this is the important part. This is the part where we're, we're telling over to them, the ones who we're supposed to tell, the story. So we want them to be involved. We want them to be alert. We want them to be engaged. And so to discourage them from running off, we do everything that we can to keep their interest. And we begin the Mangid section of the Haggadah by inviting the poor to join the Seder. The Seder tray is, tray is moved aside, a second cup of wine is poured, and the child, who is by now bursting with curiosity, asks the honored, time-honored question, Why is this night different? Uh, sorry, Mikol Halelot. Why is this night different from all other nights? This is the summary question, and it has four parts. It's traditionally sung by the youngest child at the table who is capable of asking questions. So obviously a baby won't do it, but by the time the child is like three, right, they should be able to ask the questions. Although my experience is most three-year-olds three are too shy to actually ask the questions. Even if you practice with them for weeks, when it comes time to actually do the four questions at the Seder, usually a three-year-old is still not going to do it. But anyway, so traditionally, it's said by the youngest child at the table who is capable of asking questions. And the four questions are, why do we eat only matzah and not regular bread? Why do we dip food? 
for God's sake, why do we eat bitter herbs? And why are we relaxing and reclining as if we were kings? Now, in our family, anyone who wants can recite the four questions, starting with the youngest child and then going up in age. This would be rather boring and repetitive, except for one slight detail. Anyone above the age of bar mitzvah who wants to say the four questions must do so in a language other than Hebrew or English. Now, this was loved by my kids. Well, I actually loved it too. But when they were teenagers, because it gave them something to do that involved like intense preparation for the Seder. It really got them into preparing for the holiday. They would research, they would pick a language, they would research it. Uh, sometimes they had to translate it themselves and, and uh, they would practice it until they could do it almost fluently. Languages we have heard at our Seder table include Yiddish, French, German, Celtic, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Old English, American Sign Language, and Klingon. Yes, Klingon. I think my sons did Klingon. One of my sons did Klingon probably every year. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving some out, but as you can guess, it was a highlight of our satyrs for many years. And the kids really did look forward to saying them until they grew up. It was a lot of fun. Now, the child's questioning initiates one of the most significant elements of the Passover, which is the highlight of the Seder ceremony, and that is reading the Haggadah, which tells the story of the exodus from Egypt. The answer includes a brief review of history, a brief narrative of how Abraham rejected idolatry and entered a pact with God, uh, a description of the suffering imposed on the Israelites, a listing of the plagues visited on the Egyptians, and an enumeration of the miracles performed by Hashem to redeem his people. We conclude by thanking God for having set us free from Egypt and a prayer for the final redemption. Now, number six is Rachza. And even though it sounds a lot like Yachatz, it's actually related to Urchatz. It's the same Resh Chaf. Tzadi, um, the same root, and we're going to wash a second time. At this point, things start moving quickly because everyone is justifiably hungry. At this point in the Seder, we are somewhere between an hour and a half to two hours sitting at the table, smelling the food warming in the kitchen, and everybody is ready to eat. So, after concluding the first part of the Haggadah by drinking the second cup of wine, or reclining, we wash our hands again, but this time with the blessing, as is usually done before eating bread, no one speaks until the blessing is made on the bread, and everyone has taken a piece of matzah. And I'm going to conclude today with this section here, and then we've got a few more slides to do that I'll, I'll tag on to the beginning of next week's class. Um, and then we'll segue into the more spiritual stuff. But the seventh and eighth section of the Haggadah, so now we're about halfway through the Haggadah, is what we call motzi matzah. It's actually two separate things. It's motzi, in other words, saying hamotzi, the blessing on the bread, and matzah, eating the matzah. So taking the hold of the two and a half pieces of matzah, the leader recites the customary blessing before bread, he lets the bottom matzah drop back onto the plate and holding the top whole matzah with the broken middle one, he recites the special blessing al achilat matzah, which means who has commanded us concerning the eating of matzah. And uh, then he breaks a bit of the upper matzah and at least an ounce from the middle matzah and he eats the two pieces together while reclining. The matzah, which is thusly blessed, which has been thusly blessed, is then put on a plate and passed around for everyone to take a piece. Everyone takes a small enough piece that there will be enough for everyone. And if someone needs more matzah, they can take from, usually there's a stack of matzahs on the table available for people to use to supplement 
whatever is being passed around because those who are very careful in their observance of the mitzvahs associated with the Passover Seder are very careful to eat more than a certain amount of each item so that they know that for sure they have fulfilled the obligation to eat those things. Okay, does anybody have any questions or statements or anything you want to say or add? I do. Yes. If, if one is invited to, to a Seder dinner, are you expected to take something along it's, with? It's always considered a nice thing to bring something. I recommend, and in fact, we didn't get this far, but um, I recommend um, a box of kosher for Passover par of chocolate. They're fair, it's fairly easy to get if you have any kosher grocery stores around, or if you don't have any kosher grocery stores, then maybe a small fruit basket. But, um, you know, like for example, by the time we get to dessert, everybody's really overstuffed. Even if they were still hungry when they got to dinner, mm -hmm. by the time they finished the meal, after all that matzah and everything else, everybody is super stuffed. So dessert in my house is sorbet and some chocolates and maybe some macaroons and that's it. Very light fare. So um, that, is the, that is probably something that would be appreciated. Uh, either some fruit or... Um, or some like kosher for Passover chocolate, just make sure it's marked kosher for Passover. Um, I don't recommend bringing wine unless your host says you should, um, just because people are very picky about wine. And, mm. uh, you know, especially if they're not sure if the person who's bringing it is, is actually Jewish halachically or not, they might be like a little weird about that. Um, now, if you're going to a communal Seder, um, a lot of times they tell everybody to bring their own matzah and wine. That They'll provide dinner, but you should bring your own matzah wine. So find out from wherever you're going if you need to bring something with you. Because, you know, I always, as a South African, you know, we always took something along when we were invited to, to a meal. Yes. Or, or whatever, you know, we never went somewhere empty-handed. No, we don't as Americans either. You know, so it's, I just find it, like I always, but then again, you know, you don't want to take the wrong step and offend somebody. Right. So if you bring something that looks like a gift, you know, bring us, like I said, some chocolates or um, a fruit bowl, a uh, basket or something like that, you can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that. Sure. Uh, you know, all right, I'll see you guys all on Facebook, and next week we'll finish up talking about Pesach, and you guys will both be getting ready to get on a plane. Yes, yeah. works oh, for me. Yeah. I love that. Okay, um, thank you, Panina. You have filled in some holes and blank spots. Oh, and good. I really appreciated what you've done today because it's there was information that I. I never had research, but it was still questions, you know, kind of not formulated questions. And it's like, I really have appreciated what you've had to say today. My pleasure. I try to think, what, what am I curious about as I walk through this? And then, you know, like, why do we have three matzos? Why do we have four cups? You know? <laughs> so. All right, ladies, have a wonderful week. Mazal tov on your beautiful news. And I look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks. All right. That sounds good. All right. <laughs> Take care. Bye.